show Stay Tuned brings together, together local experts, journalists, civic leaders, and regular people to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Add your voice to our conversation, and you're at the table as we stay on top of current events and go deeper, bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. From the Nine Network of Public Media in Grand Center, this is Stay Tuned. Well, it is a conversation that it seems we often just don't want to have, but it's also a conversation that perhaps we really should have as families. Welcome to Stay Tuned this week, where we are on location at the Gatesworth, here near the intersection of Del Mar and 170. Some of the residents of this senior living community are in our audience here, our on-location audience. Thank you all for being here. And at the table, we have some guests I should introduce. Deborah Schuster, owner, Deborah K. Schuster & Associates, elder in estate planning and disability law. Thanks for being here. Thank and you. Dr. Stephanie Chris from St. Louis College of Pharmacy. Thanks for being here, doctor. Thank you. Tracy Gomillion, facilitator, Death Cafe, which is a great name for a, a, that makes us want to learn more, and we will. And Dr. Charles Tadros, medical director of Hospice St. Anthony's Medical Center. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. We're talking about issues of end of life. It's, almost, it's a hard thing to even kind of spit out, end of life. It's something maybe... I guess we're all terminal, uh, but we don't want to talk about it sometimes. Uh, Deborah, I'll start with you. What is, the biggest, what is the biggest shock most Americans have when they start dealing with these issues, when they're talking about issues of end of life? Well, the, the biggest issue is that they don't talk. And most people, when they come to my office, something has happened. They've either received a diagnosis or someone has started declining, and there's a crisis. So that's really the biggest issue, and they, they don't know where to start to have the conversation, and they don't know when to start the conversation, and so that's really the biggest issue. Why? Why don't we talk? People don't like to talk about these things. People don't like to confront their own mortality. Um, in our society, I think death is not a natural part of living, even though we all deal with it. Um, I think it's something that people just don't want to deal with. Okay, so it's something we should be dealing with, I Absolutely. gather. Absolutely. How? How do we start this conversation? There's a lot of things to break down here about what we should be talking about. Maybe, maybe how is the first question. Well, certainly some sort of catastrophe, calamity, urgency that uh, starts the conversation. Um, but sometimes it triggers afterwards thoughts about our own, our relatives, uh, other people who are not in crisis. And that's certainly uh, the opportunity to, to talk about uh, then once the acute crisis is over, uh, talk about for the rest of the family, other, other relatives, other loved ones that experienced it or witnessed it. Why is this so important? Why are, all, why are the four of you telling me that this is something families should talk about? Well, our society is getting older, and technology and pharmaceuticals are keeping people alive longer. And um, this is a natural part of living. And so I think even when kids go to college and they're magically adults at 18, they should be, at least from a legal perspective, creating documents that even unfor unfortunately ask them to consider if something tragic happened, what would you want in terms of end-of-life treatment? So is that what we're talking about, is just the, the way things are handled in a hospital? Or are we talking about money and other very practical issues as well? Everything. Everything. I think it's everything. I mean, I think that the, the most simple reason about why we have to talk about this is that we're all going to die. And I think we have to be able to say it just like that. We're all going to die. Our lives are finite here, and I think that the more we talk about it, the more we're able to appreciate what we live each day. And especially in the end of life, no matter if that occurs in your teens or in your 90s, if you want your wishes to come across at that stage, you have to express that and communicate that because there's going to be a point when you're not going to be able to communicate those things. Okay, well, let's focus on that for a second. How do you make that happen? Well, from a legal perspective, you put it in writing. But that's only part of it, and that's through durable powers of attorney, usually a durable power of attorney for health care that allows you to appoint someone to make health care decisions for you if you become unable to and then what's commonly known as the living will, which is really the document that 
stands alone and speaks to your health care providers and says that if I am in a terminal condition, a persistent vegetative state, all of those medical terms um, that lawyers try to use in these documents, would you want to be resuscitated? Would you want certain medical procedures to prolong your life artificially? And so that's where you start from a legal perspective, but more important is the conversation. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. I mean, if you don't start having the conversation, I think, early and normalize it, um, I think that to me, that's, at least it, for me and why I'm interested in this topic, it's because death was so normalized to me as a child. And I feel like as a result, I've always felt like death is just going to happen. It happened to my gerbil whenever I was a kid, and it's going to happen to me, same way. And I think the more that we become comfortable with that, the more we're able to share it with other people and get those conversations started with them. So just backing up for a second, on a very practical level, you go, to, you go see an attorney, there's a, there's a simple form to fill out and that's it and it's done? Or, or are these things uh, kind of malle malleable and, and, and complex? They are. They, they evolve. Mm -hmm. And so how do you help, help me, walk me through this. If I, <laughs> should I have an, okay, I, you've convinced me I'll have these conversations with my parents. How, how practically do I get this stuff in writing? Well, you do see a lawyer. Or there are free forms that the Missouri Bar in Missouri mm -hmm. has that is a healthcare directive that you can download, and it's a basically fill in your names of people who, the person and a successor that you want to make decisions, and then questions, you know, if you're at the end of life, would you want to be on an artificial ventilator? Would you want dialysis? But the document is just the first part. Again, the conversation to make sure the people you've appointed and your family members and your doctors know what you want. Talk to me about the money, because uh, we're, we're talking about kind of the very acute stage of this uh, conversation here. But let's back up, because um, I, I'm gathering uh, Medicare, for instance, doesn't cover everything when it comes to where you might want to live, for instance. Yeah, Medicare covers for end-of-life hospice and very specific parts of hospice. So, for instance, if you have a hospice house or a facility where you go reside for the last day of your life, uh, it doesn't cover room and board, for instance, but it'll cover the nurses, the, the, the social workers, the nurse aides, et cetera. So there's certain pieces that, that Medicare does cover as a benefit for the last six months, and even more than six months if somebody survives longer than six months. But a lot of stuff the, uh, that, that people do need at home or nursing facilities, it's not covered, and that is one of the issues we run into over and over again. Is that, yeah. a, is that a surprise for, to a lot of people? Oh, I, absolutely. Mm -hmm. People think that Medicare covers everything, and really Medicare covers acute um, medical issues in the hospital, and if you are in the hospital and then are discharged and you need to go to a skilled facility such as that which is provided by the Gatesworth and other facilities, Medicare covers up to 100 days of skilled rehabilitation or nursing care if you continue to meet their medical criteria, but it's not the end-all be-all. So how do I get ready? It's well, it's um, long-term care insurance. It is so long-term <laughs> care, which is actually as a physician, I'm going to tell you, it's very hard to get. I think it's harder to get mm -hmm. than life insurance. In oh, a lot it of ways. is. Long-term yeah. care insurance is harder to get than mm -hmm. life insurance. I, in my experience, um, so what we're talking about is a type of insurance that you get in advance in order to help you pay for either at home care through aides or nurses or nursing facility care and other things that are not covered by insurance. Um, I find that, that uh, some of the uh, exclusion uh, criteria, et cetera, are, are very difficult to, to supersede in order to get it. So that's one of the things we run into. We talk about that, but it's hard to get, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, but it, it, people deplete the resources, and it sets up family issues. Whenever they, whatever they were going to pass on to kids or grandkids is depleted in order to care for their, uh, the, 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 loved, the, the patient for the remaining days of their life. Yeah. And people are even afraid of, of those words. Hospice mm -hmm. is a real is a very scary term to a lot of people. Um, but particularly for clients of mine, and I'm sure all of ours, it's never really too early to introduce at least the subject. Why is it scary? Why is hospice a word that we just don't want to use? Hospice, I think, is associated with this idea of failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother had dementia for eight and a half years, and she was on hospice and then off of hospice, mm -hmm. and that can happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but the quality of care that people get on hospice and the precursor, palliative care, which is probably you can explain it better than I can, is just it's a wonderful 
type of care where someone, for example, who has dementia where there isn't a cure, but it just gives they and their family just so much support emotionally and, and mm -hmm. in other ways. Palliative care? Yeah, um, so palliation or palliative care, I mean, uh, is, is helping suffering in the non-terminal patients and people with severe illnesses, significant illnesses, shortness of breath and heart failure in somebody who has more than six months to live. So to help them with, uh, we won't cure them, but help them with diuretics and, and vasodilators, all these fancy terms, but to help them uh, breathe better, uh, have more energy, but it's not a cure. And that's what a lot of uh, primary care specialists do anyway. Uh, but we've put a, t a, t a name on it, um, and it's one of the things that actually is, is up and coming um, as a humongous uh, uh, program in a lot of hospitals nowadays is inpatient, outpatient palliative care. Sounds like this is, uh, this is a big part of this conversation we're talking about. If you, if you, if you kind of have to reprogram your, your kind of the family's understanding yes. of these terms, that might, because if, if we go into this stage and we haven't talked about it, gosh, that hospice is exactly what you said. It kind of has a negative giving up kind of uh, a feel to it. And people may assume hospice equals cancer diagnosis too, a lot of times that's mm -hmm. associated. Mm -hmm. um, one of the really unique and good parts of hospice and palliative care is the collaborative practice between your physician, your social worker or case manager, um, the nurse, the, if you the have body. physical, yes, physical needs, pharmacist, uh, it's a whole team effort, nutrition, clergy, pastoral care, not just through those days, but also after and through the grieving process can mm -hmm. be very significantly helpful for the family. Right. Hospice generally stays in contact with the family for a year following mm -hmm. the death of the, of the patient, which is um, a really brilliant thing that they do. I know that after my grandmother died and was in hospice, I really, I really appreciated getting those letters in the mail. Um, and they came just at the right time, I always felt like. Mm -hmm. And it was just a reminder that someone knew I was grieving. It didn't, it didn't end at my three days bereavement leave at work, right? Things still hurt six months later. Things were still hurting at nine months. And things were still hurting at 12 months when I stopped getting the letters. But they told me that that was okay and that was normal. And they really normalized the grieving process, which I think is a, a real added benefit of hospice that it offers to families. Did you have all the conversations you wanted to and that you thought, and I don't mean uh, you know, beyond the personal conversation, but the, the, sure. in terms of the things we're talking about here, had you covered all those bases? Oh, absolutely. My grandmother and I did nothing but talk about death. Um, it was kind of her favorite thing to talk about. So we were, I mean, now you understand why I like talking about death with everyone. And I was her power of attorney. So I also knew all of her um, wishes, her final wishes. And it was um, a truly incredible experience when she did have a fall and a traumatic brain injury to be able to act on her behalf. It made me feel like it was the biggest sort of blessing that I could give to her at the end of her life to make a decision that she would have made for herself. Uh, the, the man who does research for us here on Stay Tuned is Dick Weiss, and he recently sat down with a group of seniors at the Crown Center for Sen Senior Living and talked to them about the plans they have already made and what they still need to do as they get older. Here's Dick. Uh, thank, thank you all for uh, joining me, and um, I'd just like to start the conversation with each of you about when you began to think about strongly the end of your life. Marvin? Probably uh, in my 50s when I was still actively working and uh, just began to look at my own parents and uh, it kind of gave me time to, to reflect upon uh, my own life in relation to them but in relation to my spouse and, and my children. Melvin, uh, tell us about your experience. When did it, you begin to think about end of life? Well, uh, first of all, I thought about it when my stepfather died of cancer 10 years ago. And, I, and we had to go through hospice and all that. However, it really set in once I moved here to Crown Center. Uh, I started thinking about my life and what I would expect and proof of, I mean, P.O. 
A, which is power of attorney. We talked a lot about the paperwork that needs to be done and the policies that you need to have, but there's uh, just a whole lot of um, family or relationships that need to be taken care of that have nothing to do with the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And resentments. I mean, you can not approve what some one person does, you know, and, and or the other, or, or become critical of how much they're doing, or feeling like you're having to do it all and the other one isn't contributing. So we we were very, very aware of those things and made the effort. You know, I don't want to be a burden to my children if I can at all help it. So I made the decision at that time that I would make my moves as I get older before I had to. So I could do it under my choice and my work and, and, and be adjusted to the place if my mind started going. I come in on my own, I'm still in good enough shape that I can take care of myself and I could do things the way I want it. Muriel uh, Beckerman, you are the better half of this couple with uh, <laughs> Marvin. And so now your children, are, are, are you uh, yes. involving them? In, uh... We are, we are trying. Uh, they're not too enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. We have a home, and they want us to just, you know, get rid of it and clean it out and get out of there. Mm -hmm. And we're not ready. We like being in our own home. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're able to take care of ourselves. And it's a single family home? Single family Multi home. Multi-stories? No, it is a ranch. It's a ranch house. At least okay. it's that. Okay. So you can, you can age in place a We can more successful. Hopefully, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but yes, we do get a lot of criticism. Melvin, you do not have long-term care? No, I do not. Okay, what, what, did you consider it? I considered it when I was working, mm -hmm. and I changed my mind on it. Now I regret that decision. Uh, you think, think it's too late? Definitely Maybe too just late. Just because the premiums would be yes. so high? Yes, I uh, called around, and so I'll just... Um, deal with it when it comes, whatever happens, you know, and um, that weighs heavily because I don't um, want to leave my family burdened, and uh, it's not easy thinking about your own demise. When you get to be a certain age, you, I'm not scared of dying, but it's not something I care for. My biggest fear has always been getting Alzheimer's like my mother and losing my mind. I mean, it's, it's really been taking some thinking to make the choice to stay living, you know, because I had thought about it. And in my life, so I wouldn't have to go through that or put my family through that or anything, but that is not an option. So uh, you, you mentioned, uh, some of you, the, the kids. and. Uh, Talk a little bit about, if, if you would, uh, how that is gone. Has it been uh, sometimes difficult, or have, have they gotten on board with, with the notion of your passing? Um, I, I just got to talk, and listening to you today, I realized I need to talk more to them. I need to go and sit down with both of the children together and let's talk over what, what direction we're going to take and what we're going to do. Because I do believe strongly that the children need to know you're not doing your child, children a favor if you make all decisions without having them in on it and know what's going on, how you're thinking, and stuff like that. I'm blessed because I'm um, healthier than a lot of, uh, a number of my friends that I know and some of my family. You know, I never, uh, expected my brother to have a stroke. No one counts on that, but I try to do the best I can with what I have right now. But uh, as far as dying, like I said, I'm not scared of dying. That's just the part of life. Yeah. That doesn't have any fear, although I'm not ready now, okay? <laughs> <laughs>Whose job is it to start the conversation? Anybody. Anybody. People, people assume that older folks are afraid of talking about death because they're closer to death. They're not. Uh, it's very comforting for my parents. They had their funeral plots laid out. Year, my in-laws, uh, you know, same thing. It's very comforting to have some of that stuff laid out. 
um, whether it's an envelope with all their paperwork or their, their, their dress or their gown or their suit, that's actually very comforting for a lot of folks. Now, it's quite different whenever you're younger and some other things, but the quick answer is uh, for a lot of people, it's okay to start the conversation. Because mm -hmm. it sounds like there's a lot of scary stuff that can happen if you aren't prepared. Right. Well, and that's what people don't realize because it's kind of like, if I don't talk about it, it's not going to happen. Well, it will. Death and taxes happen. We have you in the white coat here. Let's talk about the, the medicines as we get older and change. Are there some specifics we should be talking about there? In general, no, nothing really specific. But over your lifetime, say you're diagnosed with blood pressure, high blood pressure, you might be on three different medicines to control your blood pressure. Your blood pressure goals will change as you get older. They might not be as aggressive as they once were. Uh, and you might need a decrease in your dosing because as we get older, our bodies metabolize and eliminate the medications differently. I want to go back to um, we were talking about filling out the forms uh, in terms of your power of attorney or your last wishes and whatnot. Uh, are there some specifics that individual hospitals, specific forms that they may want uh, where if you may walk in with some prepared documents and they might say, no thanks, we needed you to have signed our documents. Is that, is that something that you can run into? So um, you can, but um, there's a federal law called the Patient Self-Determination Act, which is from, believe it or not, 1991, that says hospitals and other health care facilities are supposed to ask people, do you have durable powers of attorney? And they're supposed to make forms available. So usually hospitals don't have their own forms Frankly, it's financial institutions that usually say, oh, no, you had to have signed our own financial uh -huh. durable power of attorney. But hospitals know they're really looking for people to have had these documents and have them in place because it really helps everybody. So should we be seeking out the financial, financial institutions for their documents? No. Um, <laughs> you should just have a financial durable power of attorney in place. But... So a lot of the conversations I unfortunately do have is once somebody is no longer able to make decisions for themselves and pay their own bills, I'll be called by family members that says, you know, so-and-so bank will not accept my, the financial power of attorney that my dad created, and we have to have a conversation with the bank. But by and large, hospitals are not like that. Can, when do people come to the Death Cafe? When? Like at what point in their life? Or how do they find out about you? They find out about it through friends, generally. I mean, we have a Facebook page, but I highly doubt that's how everyone's finding us. Um, but people, they talk to each other after they come to the death cafes. I know that 20 years ago, whenever my, my mother died, um, there was casseroles that filled up a deep freeze. And I remember whenever my grandmother died and I was an adult, I didn't get one casserole. And it was because my generation doesn't bring each other casseroles. But I felt like, what a loss. Like, I was so upset. Why am I not getting a casserole? I, that would be so delightful to have a casserole Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and I, I am a casserole giver at, upon death, okay? Um, but Forget I think, the cards. Bring the food. I, exactly. Because, you know, that's what we end up and say whenever someone's like, whatever you need, just tell me. No. Just do something. Just do something. No one's going to ask you to do something. Just come over and say, I'm doing your laundry whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. Or I'm cleaning your house. I'm going to get your groceries. I'm bringing you food. Um, those are the things that are more helpful upon death, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think part of it is people don't know how to react. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody is, someone's dying, they, I think part of having a living will and documents that go into detail gives people guidance, gives family members something to do. I tell people, if you want candles, if you want certain music, put it in your document mm -hmm. to give people, people are looking for something to do. You know, so, uh, being present, and we, we talk about doing and, 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 and medicines and other things, but sometimes just plain old being present um, is, no matter how much technology, how much experience, how many times it's, you know, why we've been present, uh, been present in, to do stuff, but sometimes just being present for families, mm -hmm. um, not saying anything, just being there. Yeah is uh, kind of magic. Um, it's not something they quite teach you in med school. They teach you this in, in spirituality and faith and metaphysical, but, but being present, is, um, it's hard to do. 
And it's also okay to feel horrible mm -hmm. or to have questions and to be confused during the process, but talk with people and seek help. There's many resources available for that. Um, well, I guess lastly, I'll just ask you if you could, if you could speak to individuals, to families, to just one piece of advice, what would it be? Start now. Just start now wherever you are. Everybody says, well, I'm not sick. Good. Do it now. When you're 18, have these documents created. If you're 20, it doesn't matter when you are, but start the conversation and have the documents in place. I'd have to echo that. It's never too early, but it can be too late. And it's also not too early to just live a healthy lifestyle and to do those preventable things that we medicine people encourage people to do, but really looking at what are your goals in life and what do you seek over your lifetime? And there are ways to come to that end goal. Well, I would say definitely go to a death cafe <laughs> and bring a friend and talk with your friend before and after. And definitely talk about what your good death is, because if your good death is a home funeral, let's make that happen for you. If your good death is something else, then, then let's make that happen for you. Speak to your physician, your medical care team. Uh, express your wishes, not just on paper, but uh, verbally. And do it over often, because things do change as you have life experience. Um, I think it's very important. Thank you to the Gatesworth and to the, uh, to the residents here for hosting us and uh, making us feel welcome. And thank you to all of you for uh, your expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching.